everyone. Welcome for another holistic creative chat. And today I am super excited to welcome Kyla Givehand, a book artist, art journaler, art journaler, and creative business strategist. That's so great. Thank you for being here, Kyla. Thank you so much, Haley, for having me. I am huh, a little bit nervous, but also very excited to talk to you and um, just be in conversation with another creative. So yeah, absolutely. Okay, so a little bit of backstory. Um, I am offering a lesson in Kyla's program this year. The program is called The Journey Within, which is Kyla walks you through each month, you make a different handmade journal, and then there's all kinds of us guest teachers, and you have some core guest teachers too, who are offering lessons each month to help you fill your journals. So it's a really beautiful program. And that's how this connection was made between us. And uh, so again, super happy to have you here and for that connection to have been made that way and for us to be deepening it this way. And so I have some questions that I ask everybody on this and oh. I'm looking at my questions now because I want to start somewhere different with you, Kyla. <laughs> Yay. Oh. <laughs> so, okay. So I realized um, at some point months ago when we first started connecting that mm -hmm. your background is in writing. You actually have formal training in writing, creative writing. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So what I'm curious about as we begin is whether or not visual expression and art making was there a point where that became part of your creative practice or was it kind of always along the way? Where do those two like mesh for you and how did the visual portion come in for you? Yeah, no, that's actually a really great question. Um, I don't think anyone's asked me that before, so I have to kind of think a little bit, but um, I would say I've always been a visual learner. Like that has always been the way that I consume information and comprehend things, but my output has always been um, with the written word because it helps me to see what I'm actually thinking um, before I, you know, can really truly fully embrace it and comprehend it. So I would say, you know, when I did my MFA, so I, I kind of did my MFA late in life, technically. Um, I didn't do the traditional path of, you know, go right from high school to undergrad to MFA, right? Mm -hmm. I did a few degrees in between and mm -hmm. I stayed in that because I've been a, a teacher, a college professor for 18 years. Like I did the whole, I had a whole career and a life before I did my MFA. Mm -hmm. And it was really, um, it was really in that program that I've learned and discovered book art. Mm -hmm. um, I knew about, I had, I had done a little dabbling with making my own books just from like printer paper and just trying things and folding it different ways. Um, but I had never taken a class. So when I did the MFA, there was a book art department mm -hmm. and it wasn't a major you could you could sort of minor in it you could take you know all the classes and have the equivalent of a minor and it wasn't until I started taking those classes that my words and and my the way my brain understands things were able to come together um, I think I kind of needed someone to show me what was possible mm -hmm. to even be able to imagine what I could do so um, I studied under Julie Chen, who's a world-renowned, she's internationally known for her book arts. Um, she makes the most intricate, like her books are like magic to me. I look at them and I'm like, how do you make a piece of paper do that? It, <laughs> it seems <laughs> not to me. Um, and so through, through that class, and we did lots of critiques, so you would bring your project in, bring in your prototype, and the other students would say, oh, okay, well, what if you did this? And have you thought about that? And the process was really unlock it unlocked something in my brain um so I, I would say that i have to give credit to the mfa program and and unlocking it i think i always dabbled with like oh here's a snapshot of me and my friends in high school i'll put it in my diary and then right next to it mm -hmm. so i've already always kind of i had the idea of how visuals and words can go together but it wasn't until again the possibilities were unlocked that i was like oh Oh, I now, oh, you could do that. Who knew you could do that? Um, and so it was that kind of, um, and we were allowed to play a lot and experiment yeah. and make lots of mistakes. It was encouraged. And so I think that safe space, knowing it was okay if I made a mistake, um, not having to be perfect, which is one of my things, I'm like really struggling with perfectionism and um, how it stifles us. So yeah, I would say that I have to credit that. So that would have been 2008. Eight mm -hmm. um, that I really truly started to unlock how my words and because I was there doing a, a MFA in poetry mm -hmm. um, and poetry can be so visual especially when you look at like haiku oh, yes. 
folks who've, you know, in the Japanese tradition, who've written um, very, uh, their poems are a lot about nature and what they see out their window and how they interpret the world. Um, so yeah, it was, it was a really beautiful marriage between mm. poetry and the book art for me. I love that. And I love that it was, it was kind of already something intuitively within you. And then that was just kind of like, like the gelling, the piecing together for you. And then you got to really explore it in this, in these other ways when you were given permission to do so and given like inspiration places to jump off of. And, and now that's what you do now, which is so super cool. And, and I think really what you're speaking of about like, this processing thing. I mean, obviously with the art journaling craze, there's visual and writing going together, right? And, and there's so many of us who can really relate to that. But a piece that you said that seems so important to me, at least in my own process, and I know with many of the women I work with too, is that there's something about, first of all, writing as a process where we, we don't always maybe have a total grasp on what we're thinking, like you said, until you write it out. And then also something about the visual that adds this whole other layer. To me, it's almost like a, an adhesive for the process or like a substrate or something where it's all kind of in there and it comes together in a way that we can feel it yeah. in that kind of visual expression. Yes. And so how both of those can be such key points to like understanding the creative process and what we're, we're moving through and expression. I love the word adhesive to describe that. That is so absolutely um, a good way of thinking about it. Yeah. So thank you for yeah. that. <laughs> mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. I, uh, to me, they, they go hand in hand as well. And very much in the same way in my process too, is like, I don't really know what I'm trying to say or think until I write it. <laughs> like, you know, and then, and then the visual element that's, I've always had that piece too, for me is like a natural way to go explore. So I can um, tell that from your art too. Um, just the, the um, essence and origin classes that I've mm -hmm. taken with you, mm -hmm. just the way, the way you describe the lessons for me, like I've, I feel like I, which is the reverse for me usually, I feel like I get so much just listening to you talk mm -hmm. about it mm -hmm. before we even get to the actual lesson. Mm -hmm. um, so it's almost like you've given me this um, this way of thinking about it differently that I hadn't um, sort of anticipated before. So especially in the essence class, I'm finding that that is, mm -hmm. is true. So yeah. Oh, well, thank you for saying that. That's good. Yeah. And I love how we all as as artists and creatives have different ways of teaching too. And you mentioned that you, you have a like, background experience in teaching extensively yeah. it sounds like and i gotta tell you like that shines through in your programs okay. you are so good at teaching and what you do it is it's just like wow and the charisma that comes off of you when you do it is just really really wonderful oh, so you. yeah so i now i want to take this a little bit um a little bit deeper even and go okay so was there a point in your creative process or creative practice, or can you speak to a time or a point when you had a profound realization, either like a connective point or a really felt experience of the connection between creative process and some, some sort of healing process that you were moving through in your life? Mm -hmm. Wow, so many. <laughs> yeah, I know. Right? <laughs> but let me, uh, let's see. Yeah. So for me, I think it was probably, you know, I have to go, I, I'm going to probably a lot of my answers are probably going to go back to the MFA moment mm -hmm. because it was really a, um, it was really a pretty powerful time in my life um, as, as an artist and creative and a writer, but really as a woman, mm -hmm. um, it was the first time in my life where I truly embraced being female. Um, and I know that sounds weird because if, you know, if you're female, you, you might feel female all the time, but it wasn't until I realized what I didn't know about myself as a woman mm. that I was like, Oh, I've kind of been denying this part of myself for a long time. So just to give a little bit of context, Mills college is where I did my MFA and Mills is a, um, all female undergraduate and then the graduate level is co-ed. Mm. Um, but the undergraduate is, is, is all women. And it traditionally has always been that. And so you, I would be in writing classes where it would just be all women in mm. the class. Um, and I'd never experienced that before and never, and I mean, all, all ages, all backgrounds, all ethnicity, like all, just, it was amazing for me. Um, 
it made me almost feel like I had been sheltered for 30 years <laughs> because I was in my thirties when I did my MFA. Mm -hmm. So for those of you listening, it's never too late um, right. to follow your dream. It was a dream I had when I was like 17 or 18 years old to be a writer and be a poet. And, you know, everybody was like, you can't make any money doing that. You got to get a real degree. You got to get something that makes mm -hmm. sense, you know? So I struggled with that. So I would say, um, you know, in 2000 and probably seven, I had a 2006, 2007, I had a life changing uh, health thing happen to me. And I had to have a surgery. It was the first time I had ever had surgery. And it was supposed to be really super, you know, outpatient, in and out. It'll be fine. It'll be quick. We do this all the time. Well, I was, you know, in the hospital longer than I was supposed to be. And there were complications. And it just, it sent my life into a tailspin. And it actually made me realize that I had been denying myself something that I would have regretted. I mean, as much as one can regret if you pass away without doing something you really wanted to do in the world, but just that idea of, oh my God, what if I had not come out of this thing? Um, so anyway, that's how I ended up doing, you know, applying for the MFA and actually, you know, going. And so I would say that moment for, of healing for me um, kind of started even a little bit before the MFA where I decided, you know what? Writing is a thing I want to do. I want to commit to it. I have all these other degrees. This is going to be the degree that is for me and not for society, what society says I'm supposed to do. So I got there and I really, truly, I had a blossoming and um, it takes my husband to tell the story. He can tell it also. Mm. I can because he was on the outside looking in. He's known me since I was 13 years old. So he was able to see this drastic like blossoming of a woman for me. Um, everything from just like appreciating my hair, appreciating my, you know, so for me, it was a, a huge healing, something that I didn't even know needed to be healed inside of me. Um, and it, it came out as I was working on my thesis. Um, I did a thesis on uh, really about women, the women in my family is kind of how it started. It's called the Legion of a Legion of Matriarchs. And it was really a conversation between the women in my family. So there was a poem that was in the voice of each of the women in my family. And then there was a, a, a voice in the book or in the thesis. Um, I gave, I personified Shane and I gave her a voice and I had her in conversation with the women in my family. And I'm getting chills just thinking about it. It's been a long time since I talked about this thesis, but um, <laughs> the hair is raising on my arms. What a powerful, powerful creative piece to move through. It was wow. Two years of my life was spent working on like writing these poems and calling. And, and a lot of it I had, I felt like I had to call my aunties and actually talk to them. I was writing a poem in their voices and it was some of it was me remembering them from age, you know, 12. And I was like, you know, I should talk to them today. And so it required a lot of conversations with my mother and um, lots of conversations with my aunts and really just reconnecting to these women who, who raised me, who um, a lot of our family is shrouded in shame. And a lot of things that we do, we pass it on to the kids, the other girls in the family and the Man, it was such a, so I would say for me, that was the healing moment is like trying to work through these poems where I was writing in the voice of other women, um, women that I knew and loved. And, but then to actually talk to them and go through that process of like documenting their um, story and their version of our family story too. Cause that's a whole other thing is like, you, you read the poems and you're like, huh. That, that one says every Friday they had fish fries. This one says every Friday there were fights in the, you know, so yeah. it was like, yeah. So it was a really, um, and it, and it was a lot of healing for me. I needed that. I didn't know I needed it. Um, but it, uh, it gave me a voice that I didn't even know. I, I'm a, I'm a pretty vocal person. I'm not shy. I'm not, you know, I will speak up. I will speak up for the disenfranchised if, if given the opportunity and, or if the opportunity presents itself and I just need to take the opportunity to do it. Yeah. Um, I've never been someone who didn't feel like she had a voice, um, until I realized that I actually had been keeping a part of myself very silent and very quiet. Um, and a lot of it was because of shame. Mm. And so I was able to heal from a lot of that. Not that I'm completely done healing and I have arrived kind mm -hmm. of moment. It was a huge, huge veil lifted 
off of me, um, off my eye, over my eyes, a weight. I felt the weight of my family lift off of me. Like you're not responsible for mm. past transgressions. <laughs> so yeah, so that was a really, um, and, and so that doing that along with uh, book art classes at the same time, I ended up, and I don't think I, it, I left it on the shelf there, but I ended up creating um, a book art piece to supplement or to kind of go with that um, thesis. And it was really the recipes. Each, each woman in my family has a recipe that she's known for. And that is the thing. And if you're going to have a family gathering, only a certain auntie gets to make the red velvet cake. <laughs> yeah. You, know I mean? like, you can try, but no one's going to eat yours if hers is also at the table. Right. Uh-huh. It's that kind of thing. And so I did a book art piece that was like a recipe box with a bunch of and, and it was it was more than just the recipe, but it was also the, the back of the card had the story behind the recipe behind how this woman became the one known for that particular recipe. So it, that that process too, because again, I had to call them and say, can I get the recipe? And some of them were like, yes, but there's one ingredient I'm not going to give. You <laughs> Your family <laughs> too, huh? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so that, that whole process was really um, the moment where the two came together. And I thank you for asking me that question. I've never actually had to articulate it like that and to talk about the two together they've always stood separately and still do kind of stand separately from if anybody you know you can go to the mills library and actually take my thesis off the shelf and read the poems but the the book art piece there's it's one of a kind i only made one and it lives in my house so nobody else would actually necessarily know how to put those two things together um to get a fuller picture of the women in my family so thank you for asking me that i've never absolutely and what a what a powerful process you went through and there are so many layers of that layers of healing just you diving into the vulnerability and the shame that you realized was being carried coming into a class of all women and knowing that you're you're claiming something about yourself and what it means to be a woman in a different way and realizing whether intuitively or conscious obviously consciously because you made your whole thesis about it that that meant actually looking at the lineage stories around that and then the honoring of like I love that you made this book of recipes and this nourishment piece and from each of the women that you also had these different stories and perspectives from on the dynamic of the family and all of that coming together and then how I can imagine how through that by orienting yourself to this like beautiful pot of stories you were able to go oh here's where they stand and oh here's where I stand and it, wow, just what a powerful process that that really speaks to, I think, the healing power of, of creativity and creative process. And also that you recognize this beautiful thing about healing, which, you know, having worked as a nurse, this became so profound to me again and again, is that healing is, is never, like you said, arriving at a destination. It is, it is something that we open ourselves to, and then it becomes a process through life. And and that that is that's the piece that's hard for people sometimes going oh here's the thing that needs to be opened yeah. because there's a lot of fear I'm at that point. Make me cry right now oh. thinking about it <laughs> <laughs> thank you for sharing that i am so moved by your journey oh my gosh so um so my next question i think you kind of already have spoke to this, but I want to see if you have anything else that comes up to add to this. It's really about um, one of the things that I love about you and that I knew we had an instant kind of connection as far as our love of creativity and the creative process. At, at what point, and maybe it was this story you shared, maybe it was another time, but when did you start to realize that creativity and making your art, whether writing or visual, really was like the juice and the pivotal part of it was not the outcome, but was the process? Was that always your way or was that something that you came to a realization of? Yeah, no, it was definitely not always my way. Um, I'm very much, uh, so I'm Capricorn, A-type. All the things you think when you hear Capricorn and all the things you think when you hear A-type, I am quintessentially those things. (laughs) Um, And so it's always, for a long time, it was always about the product. Is the product, you know. And I, I didn't always allow myself to fully experience the process of getting to that end result. Um, so I, I would say it would probably, to be completely honest, in the last five to six years, I would say, is when I fully embraced the process as a true part. Like, you know, 
I could probably pinpoint little places along the way, one or two things that I did. I was like, okay, the process, the process is really important. Um, but it making it a part of my everyday and how I function, I would say probably happened in the last five or six years. Um, and one of the, I think one of the, um, biggest moments would probably be when I did the book in a day project in 2013, where I made a book every single week because there's no time to be worried about. I mean, it really has to be about the process, like the process. I had to think of the process as a 52 week process instead of thinking of it each week, there's a product I have to produce. Instead, I said, no, there's a, there's a process I'm going through over 52 weeks. Mm -hmm. Um, And really the process, I know people see the books and they see the videos and they're out there and people can go back and watch my journey. And, but really, and truly it was the process of becoming and calling myself, giving myself permission to be an artist Mm. Um, and to really truly be able to say, I'm an artist. Mm -hmm. My medium is books and paper. And that's how I, Um, express myself creatively, but I needed a way, I needed a process to get me to that. Like a lot of people go to art school, right? Mm -hmm. And that is their, that's the process, right? For me, that was the same thing with the MFA and poetry. I had always been a poet, but for some reason I felt like I needed something that I could help me say the words, I am a poet. Sure. Um, It wasn't about being published or, but it was about going through that process of the MFA reading other poets, being in conversation with other poets. It was that process. So I would probably say the same is true of my, of my book art. I did book art for a while. I worked with Julie. I was her assistant for a year. I looked at her books and thought they were magic. Then I worked for her and I was like, oh, they're not magic. They mm-hmm. actually, there's actually the way you fold this to make it do that, right? And I, I learned that through process. So it took, it took some time for me to get to that um, mm-hmm. in the course of my life. But I would say in the last five to six years, I really fully embraced it um, as a part, you know, just it's a part of it. You, you, once you give in to the process and you forget and divorce yourself from what the end result will be, wow, it changes yeah. things. It, it really, really does. The experience, it yes. really does. And, and, it, and it sounds like what I hear you saying too, is like, there's something crucial that happens that you, you can't really even like explain it to people. You have to immerse in it and you have to immerse in it daily, which is, is why I always say creative practice. Like it's a practice you have to come to again and again. And that's when you feel how process changes you. And so thank you for sharing that. Cause that's so, so wonderful. So, all right. And- I want to mm-hmm. I want to add one little thing to that because I yeah. just speaking to the other teachers out there. Yeah. Um, we get caught up sometimes in the fact that there's a video camera pointing at our hands yes. and we're working. Um, and sometimes we, if this is what you do as a living, it's a part of your business, and it's a part of what you. Sometimes we forget to to stay in the process to really think about the process because we're so the result is there has to be a video that goes out for our students, um, and so I. I just want to say, I'm constantly reminding myself of that, like that, that the process is just as important. And so sometimes I will off camera, make the thing first, just so I can go through the process myself. Yes. Then I will create the video for people. So, and I don't do that every time, but there are times when I know I'm going to be creating something that I think, or that I'm hoping will um, help people push past a block or, or really tap into something that I don't think they've thought about tapping into. Mm-hmm. Well, I have to go through it first yes. without the camera yes. so that I can fully experience it. So I'm just saying that because I don't want people to think that once you know it's a practice, then it's just innate and you do it. Yeah, I no. think there are moments that we have to find ourselves. <laughs> Absolutely. I'm so glad you said that too, because that will really relate to a lot of our listeners as well. And I know I certainly, you know, that's a dance finding out what that is for you as a teacher too, and how that works. I know for me, like a lot of times, sometimes I'll teach, I'll talk on video while I'm teaching, but other times I know I have to like keep the video silent and do a voiceover later because that allows yes. me to really be in my process more authentically. And so yes. finding that balance and realizing, and it's a vulnerable piece too, but really Realizing that as people who are out helping others develop a creative practice, it's super important that they see us, you know, moving through the process and being vulnerable in that as well at times. And so such a powerful point you've made there. Thank you. 
So I have one more question for you. <laughs> and this one is easy. <laughs> well, maybe, maybe not actually. <laughs> so you collect fountain pens. <laughs> And I want to know what your favorite fountain pen is right now. <laughs> oh my gosh. That is such a hard question. I you have no idea. The hardest question ever. Three, maybe uh -huh. three. You got top three. <laughs> okay. Right. Right now, as of today, uh -huh. I will tell you what my top three are. And they're very close. Because <laughs> I keep a stash on my desk at all times. All right. So uh, this one mm -hmm. is, I don't know if you can see that because I can't see my yeah, I can see myself it. right now, but this is um, Pilot Vanishing Point, mm -hmm. and it's my favorite because it's retractable, nice. and that's so like not pop, you know fountain pen. That's not what people think of when they think fountain pens. So that's it's one of my favorites, and it has um, it has a bold fountain. It has a bold nib, mm -hmm. which is it, the only fountain pen I own that has a bold nib, and it. It's just so beautiful and juicy when it writes like that. So this this right now is probably one of my favorite go tos because I really can just pick it up quick and start writing, and I don't have to do like a whole, you know, get it ready, uh -huh. just right out of the gate. And oh, that's oh, I love that. <laughs> that's that's my I would say my second favorite right now is probably this um, Keras Custom, mm -hmm. and this pen is. Um, it's a little bit of a, a weird thing because it's kind of heavy. It's machined. It's, it's, you know, made from aluminum and it's like a, I think welders. Mm -hmm. This would be like the kind of pen a welder would care. Like it's just, it's a substantial pen. Nice. Um, but it just, once you take the cap off and you, it, it's just a beautiful, yeah, just, it writes right out of the gate. You don't have to nice. do a whole bunch of getting it started. Um, I like pens that do that. So that. Mm -hmm. This one, I like weighty, heavy, substantial pins. So I would say that's my second. And my third is probably, <laughs> I'm just looking at the ones that I use every day. That's and so perfect. like, yeah, my everyday pins. I love a good pen. So, <laughs> <laughs> and it's so important when you're trying to get students to write, like do reflective work, you have a pen yes. you love. <laughs> yes. And I'm going to tell you, this is so funny. Every class I taught, um, as a teacher, because I was an English professor. And so mm -hmm. I would always, you know, first day, first week of class, I would, you know, we have the little icebreakers and the things you talk about. And one of the questions I always consistently ask my students is, you know, they go around the room and I'd say, tell me one thing you could teach me that has nothing to do with English or writing or anything like that, nothing to do with academics or school. What could you teach me? And they would always say, you start. And so when I would start, I would either say, I could teach you how to make a handmade book. Or I would say I could teach you how to appreciate a fountain pen. Yeah. And they'd just be like, what's, why, what's the big deal about a fountain pen? And then I would come in a day with like three or four and I would have them write with them. And they'd be like, oh, I said, it's the difference between, say, writing, um, you know, uh, writing in, say, just a regular Chevrolet type car, which is a good car and it's nice and it gets you where you got to go versus, say, a Bentley. Right, there's a difference. <laughs> they would yeah. say, like, "Really?" I'm like, "Yeah." Or a Porsche. It's an experience. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's like an experience. So anyway, mm. um, this is my third one, and it's 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 an everyday kind of pen. It's the Pilot uh, Metropolitan, mm. and it comes in a lot of cool colors. And I like to do unexpected things with the pen. So like, this is a white pen, but when you write with it, it has this really bold. And I don't think I have any. Oh, here we go. It has this really bold orange color writing. Oh, nice. Um, so I have orange ink in it. Uh -huh. So, so yeah, that's my, those, those would be my top three. Cause they're like literally right here. I've been using them over the last three weeks. Um, oh, I, love but I have it. so many, I feel so bad right now. I feel like I've cheated all my other pens by not saying they were my favorites. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for sharing that Kyla. And thank you so much for being here for holistic creative chat too. So, yeah. all right. Thanks, Thanks everybody for listening in. <laughs>